I'm Rachel Lindsay, Director of Science and Stewardship at Hill Country Conservancy and honored to also serve on the Executive Committee for the Texas Hill Country Conservation Network with Catherine and uh, others on the Steering Committee, which you'll hear more about. Uh, the network is a collaboration of conservation organizations, government entities, nonprofits, businesses, and individuals who came together with the shared mission of maximizing the protection of the Hill Country's natural resources through enhanced collaboration. These logos are the organizations that are members of the steering committee of the network, and uh, they guide this community of more than 50 different partners now, which is huge. In 2022, the network came together to release the State of the Hill Country Report, which provides, uh, establishes baseline measurements for eight different conservation metrics. The map on the left shows one of those metrics, which is uh, population growth in the Hill Country from 1990 to 2020. If you follow those white blobs of development, you can see I-35, I-10, 290, 281, population grows where roads go. This population explosion up to 190% in the fastest growing counties contributes to significant changes to our landscape. Our hill country's flowing waters and rolling hills are increasingly being fragmented by impervious sur sub surfaces, subdivisions, and it causes di disruption to our natural systems and function all the way to the loss of our starry night skies and our connection to our universe. From 2016 to 2019, we lost 115,000 acres of hill country open space to development. That's three years. This is land and function that's disrupted in perpetuity. While we need our built infrastructure, homes, roads, schools, grocery stores, power lines, water pipes, our human bodies and our human minds depend on natural infrastructure to fulfill our basic necessities of life. Clean air, fresh water, food, community, as well as our mental and emotional well-being. Protecting and stewarding natural infrastructure is a low-cost way to ensure quality of life, sustainability, and resilience we need to continue to grow and thrive as a population. Studies show every dollar invested in conservation returns four to eleven dollars in natural resources, goods, and services. In our 18 county region, which is shown in that graphic on the left, we have more than 11 million acres. We have four million residents, more than four million residents, more than three million visitors every year to the Hill Country. We have the headwaters of 12 different Texas rivers, more than 1,100 miles of pristine streams, and only 5% of the hill country is permanently protected through conservation, just over a half a million acres. The network came together to create this land, water, sky, and natural infrastructure plan to give us a common language and understanding to communicate these critical needs and benefits to our communities. And I'll have this plan later uh, for you guys to look through. It's also available online at ourtxhillcountry.org. This graphic shows those overlapping environmental, health, social, and economic benefits from nature. You can see at the vortex of our Hill Country Natural Infrastructure, right there in the middle, clean and abundant water. This graphic shows the multitude of interconnected relationships between land and water, groundwater and surface water, and protection of ecosystems like forests, 
grasslands, riparian areas, below ground caves and aquifer systems, wildlife, agriculture, and our cities. Our human actions anywhere have repercussions throughout the system. Balancing our human needs and desires requires us to be intentional to ensure these multitude of benefits. Our sustainability for future generations is dependent on our environment. Our environment is a necessity, not an afterthought. More than 2,800 residents from across the Hill Country were surveyed to create the prioritization and weighting that you see on the left of these six goals. And we're a little bit cut off on the bottom, but uh, that bottom one is access to outdoors and nature, and it's at 7%. Uh, the highest priority, which is not surprising to any of us in this room, was water supply, followed very closely by water quality. And somewhat surprising to me, followed immediately by climate resiliency. Uh, the, the details on the right side, and these graphics are all in the natural infrastructure plan. So if you're excited about them, they're online, they're in the plan. Uh, you can check it out in print too. Uh, the, the details on the right are the criteria that were used to map these different goals within the plan. And there's an abundance of maps available within the plan to help with resources for planning, strategizing, convening, and building our Hill Country Conservation Community. Each of those six goals has its own individual map within the plan, and then they were combined to provide this overall uh, prioritization map for Hill Country Natural Resources. Uh, dark green and light green are the highest priorities on this map and that beige and orange colors are the lowest priorities. Uh, and this was done specifically for the Hill Country so you can see below the Edwards Plateau when you get into the Blackland Prairie that's not as high of a prioritization but it's because those goals are related to um, the Hill Country's resources. These maps, access to outdoors and nature and increasing urban temperature are really important for equity in the Hill Country. Uh, we all this summer experienced the increasing temperatures from our cities with that heat dome that was produced and pushed away uh, those uh, climate events that we really want to experience, precipitation. Night skies are a nexus of how our urbanizing areas impact our rural areas. Most people can remember, oops, most people remember starry night skies and moments connecting with the universe through starry night skies. And so it's a place where we can really recognize that uh, our light pollution has affected our ability to see those starry night skies. And this is, unlike most conservation challenges, it's, a, um, it's an opportunity to make change really quickly just by flipping a switch and shielding lights. Uh, thinking back to that graphic with the four big buckets, night skies allow us to behold and connect with our universe. They improve human health. They're essential to migratory and resident wildlife species. They offer an economic opportunity through tourism, and they save us money through energy savings. Most exciting are our county by county breakdowns. These are individual county maps for each of those 18 counties. This is a really unique comparison between Kendall and Uvalde County because you have a very similar diversity indexes, the, the likelihood of two people chosen at random within the county to be of different racial or ethnicity groups, uh, but very different uh, social vulnerability indexes. And uh, social vulnerability is the susceptibility of those social groups to the adverse impacts of natural hazards, including disproportionate death, injury, loss, or disruption of livelihood. 
Uh, these county by county breakdowns are really critical because the different counties have different prioritization needs and we have such high cost of land right now with looming threats that we need to be able to look at it uh, individually. None of this would be possible without uh, our team of experts, advisors, consultants, survey respondents, and of course our funders, Cynthia and George Mitchell Foundation, the Burdeen Johnson Foundation, Hershey Foundation, Shield Heirs, and others helped us to do not only this, but to create this network and to sustain this network of organizations working on this. Now I'll ask for the panel to join me on stage. We have Catherine Romans, who I think you all know, the Executive Director for Hill Country Alliance, Ben Eldridge, Vice President of Conservation at Cibolo Center for Conservation, and Azalea Rodriguez, the Texas Representative at Defenders of Wildlife. Is this on? It is. <laughs> Thank you guys for joining me. At Hill Country Conservancy, we've already been using this natural infrastructure plan to assist in our planning, especially communications with elected officials and integrating these ideas into proposals. How are you and your organizations using this resource? And I think Ben, maybe you want to go first? Uh, all right, uh, if I must. So uh, first of all, good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here with all of you all. Um, it takes a team to get things done in the Hill Country. And um, you know, the Natural Infrastructure Plan I see is a guide through which we can work collaboratively or we can work with a shared, essentially vernacular about natural infrastructure so that when we're working in our various regions or on our policies uh, or our conservation strategies, we're doing so in a concerted way. And so that's, I just want to lead by saying, I'm, I'm grateful that this, this tool now exists. I hope that people will consider leveraging it. You'll hear me say that again later, I'm sure. Uh, but also, uh, it really is about everybody in this room, so really uh, glad you're here. Um, so in the city of Bernie, we, work, we started working on development codes many uh, years ago. Um, we were working specifically to get what's called a low impact development ordinance. And the, the role of a low impact development ordinance is to basically filter stream, slow uh, flood water down, filter it, uh, and uh, remove the pollutants from that water. And it's because we are upstream from a major karst recharge zone. Uh, the base flow in the Cibolo Creek, all of it, goes subsurface just downstream from us. It actually goes into a large swallow hole, and, it, and it's like watching water go down a drain of a tub. Right? It just swirls right down in there. And so all of our base flow, everything that comes off of, frankly, the Bernie landscape, almost all of it, goes into the Edwards Aquifer Recharge Zone. So that means that anybody who's getting water out of that recharge zone is getting the pollutants. But it also meant that our little, our little nature center at the time, I and mean, we were now the Center for Conservation, but we were seeing a big increase in trash that was coming into our center that we then had to clean up. And so that was one of the things that we did to try to change uh, local ordinances. We worked with uh, Dr. Troy Dorman of Half and Associates, who's actually in the audience, and uh, we're able to create a model ordinance uh, that is uh, embedded now into a very conservative community, so it's not like pointing to Austin, and that fortunately other communities are starting to see the wisdom of and apply it their own. So that's about protecting natural infrastructure. That's about protecting our water supply. Uh, an add-on to that is that there are uh, some uh, limits to what can be done in the ex, uh, extraterritorial jurisdiction, the ETJ of the city, uh, that are more commensurate with the Edwards Aquifer Protection Program rules. And that also is about protecting natural infrastructure because when it comes down to it, if we pave over this amazing, I call it, I like to call it Swiss cheese, that karst rock is like Swiss cheese. If we start carving over the Swiss cheese, paving over the Swiss cheese, if we start paving over the big fractures that convey our water subsurface, if we start messing with our stream sides that absorb the water, uh, and that's the other thing too, we have great stream setbacks now as well. Uh, if, we, if, we, if we destroy those, we lo lose the, the water absorption capacity, the flood mitigation of those stream sides, and subsequently when you lose that water absorption capacity, you're actually going to have less base flow, which means in a flood event, you're going to have more water bypass the recharge zone. So in other words, we have taken a very serious look at what natural infrastructure means to us and worked with the city of Bernie and we're increasingly working with Kendall County on how we can uh, change the development regime so that it, the regime so it's not destroying what honestly makes life possible in our region, which is the groundwater supply and the recharge features that facilitate that. So that's, that's my introduction. <laughs> 
Catherine. Well, I can jump in. Um, we, like Ben, at the Hill Country Alliance have already um, been using this report to help guide conversations and inform our work. Um, we have worked really hard. Josh Sendahar is in the back of the room. Josh is the uh, network manager who helps coordinate this collaboration of 50 nonprofit and university organizations that are working on land and water issues and night sky issues in the Hill Country. Um, and the a couple of big things that we really see opportunity for, one is more investment in protecting those natural infrastructure systems that just like roads and sidewalks um, and jails and schools and hospitals are critical to the fabric of our communities. Um, too often, we take these natural systems for granted, just assume that they'll always be there for us and don't make the investment in protecting, improving, um, and otherwise caring for them. So there have been fabulous examples of that sort of investment across the region. Kendall County is a really good one. Um, just last year, passed a, a $20 million bond for land conservation, which was a huge success for that community. And it's resources like the Natural Infrastructure Plan that can help um, direct those funds into conserving the really strategic um, properties. Uh, Travis County is another one worth shouting out. This November, um, voters in Travis County will have the opportunity um, to vote on a big bond, $200 million um, in Travis County for the protection of land and creation of, of new park resources. So that investment piece is a really important one. Ben mentioned the policy ideas as well. There are policy changes that we can implement at a city, a county, and statewide level to really prioritize uh, natural infrastructure. And then all of you are an important part of uh, that third piece of how are we empowering local advocates um, to be pointing to these resources, especially if your community is not one that can afford to do a really in-depth GIS analysis of where your most critical natural resources are. Um, we didn't show uh, the data hub that accompanies this tool, but we have created an online tool that will also be really useful in letting users kind of drill down in and out um, to their uh, particular area of focus. So we're excited about this tool, and it's only going to be as useful as folks actually picking it up and using it. So thank you, back. Catherine, yeah. for mentioning the data hub, especially. Uh, I will have my computer with the Data Hub open during lunch to play around if people want to check it out. Azalea? Sure. So um, with Defenders of Wildlife, our primary goal is to protect and restore critical wildlife species. And so with the Natural Infrastructure Plan, the way we intend and can use this tool is by strategically planning to conserve those critical habitat species and wildlife habitat areas when we're looking at what areas are in need of most conservation protection, as well as uh, Lights Out Texas. Lights Out Texas is one of our uh, leading programs, as well as a big passion project of mine. And so with that, it's really great to see uh, dark skies get touched on. And so with that, dark skies really does an incredible job and the Hill Country Alliance does a great job with spreading it through the western and majority of the uh, Hill Country where Lights Out Texas where I'm focused on is more of the uh, city areas between Austin and San Antonio to mitigate our human impacts with that and so some of the things that we see is um, increasing proclamation so right now we're at 17 across the state I believe we just added three this year and so um, kind of going in hand in hand with policy Lights Out Texas has a really good initiative to put some of this work into legislation as well. Um, and then the last thing I'll say is Defenders is a great organization that really produces a lot of tools when it comes to AI remote sensing. And so one of the ones that we just recently introduced is called WALT, W-A-L-T, which stands for Wildlife and Land Trust. And so that really does a good job at funneling money from federal agencies into land trusts. And again, it really hones in on the areas that uh, have the greatest conservation needs as we see out laid out in the natural infrastructure plan. Such a really exciting tool that we're thrilled to start using at Hill Country Conservancy. 
a big challenge in creating this plan was reaching our full community, uh, especially we worked very hard to reach the Spanish speaking community, but we were unable to achieve representative response rates. Um, connecting and forming these reciprocal relationships is really important to our success in conservation. And I'm wondering, Azalea especially, I know you have a lot of uh, thoughts and knowledge and expertise in this realm and uh, yeah, what are those obstacles, the barriers to fully reaching these communities and being able to form these relationships and uh, how do we do better? What are the challenges there? Yeah, so I think to say um, it's a challenge is, is definitely uh, to say the least because um, in the whole country across 18 different counties, um, for me, I, I'll only speak on my community, so for the Latino indigenous community, um, with the survey, and we can kind of look at it going back to the plan, um, our communities were very underrepresented when it comes to outreach and having their voices surveyed. For example, in 2019, there was about 19% of the Hill Country that was Latino. Now, according to the latest Water and Equity Report, that is at 47%. And so reaching out to those communities is not only a conservation issue, but it's an economic issue. And so when we're not reaching out to those communities and we're not getting those representations and that response, then we're really selling ourselves short when it comes to a full community basis. And I think there's a few barriers with that. I think one goes with communication. And when I've heard somebody say um, promoting some kind of conservation campaign, as our population grows across the Hill Country and really just across Texas, we really need to rethink about how we're talking about conservation and really educating what conservation actually means and what we mean by that and not only doing that in English but also doing that in Spanish because one thing that I see all the time is when I partner with somebody to do translations uh, which we have great partners local partners here on the ground that do great work with this um, a lot of the challenges with communication are the idioms we use or even just the phrases that we use in English do not always translate in Spanish. And so I would love to see more outreach and communication with both languages and I see it all the time in other nonprofits. So I really think that's a gap that needs uh, filling. On top of that, I think creating more spaces to where it's feeling more inclusive and welcoming. That being said, it's really hard to reach a community that can't relate to its leadership. And I think that's really reflected across some of our rooms or even our networks. If we kind of look across our room, there's not a lot of representation here. And so in order to reach those communities, you want to be, you want to be able to have um, th those relatability. So it's not necessarily an ethnicity issue. I think it's more of a economic issue. If you, you know, like how can someone teach you um, how to survive in low incomes if they don't know what it's like to be in low incomes or how can someone teach you to or how can you educate somebody in Travis County if they don't really live in Travis County so again it's I think it's being more relatable and opening those spaces uh, for people to be authentic and show up in those uh, areas that they want to be and I'll kind of leave it at that because um, I have a lot of you know things I'd like to put on that but um, I'd love to hear from everybody else So I think one of the one of the key pieces to that there's two things that were really jumping out to me One is basically we need to raise all consciousness, right? We need to raise our consciousness about the value of the natural land natural infrastructure that we are codependent We are connected with it in the way we treat it We're gonna get some sort of feedback from it if we if we protect it we get the benefit from it if we don't it suffers, we suffer. And we need everybody to be well-informed and participating in this. Um, so that's the thing. I, you know, I, I know there was a lot of effort to reach out to uh, the Latino and African-American, et cetera, communities. But uh, you know, even with some funding that went to, to support that, it was hard, right? And uh, we definitely want to see more uh, engagement in the future. The, the second piece was economics. This is an economic issue, y'all. We do not, if we don't have healthy natural infrastructure, we're gonna see economic impacts. So when I do a lot of advocacy, I emphasize economics, quality of life, and human safety. That touches all of us, and we need to make sure everybody's consciousness is raised accordingly. I love that we're able to start using terminology like natural infrastructure and nature-based solutions and have these become common terms and figure out the translations that work in, in Spanish, not just translating, but actually speaking the language. 
and connecting with people in their native language. What are the things that you're most excited about in this plan? Catherine? Sure, yeah. Well, maybe I'll swing back to one of the big challenges, going back to um, challenges of reaching the full diversity of the Hill Country you know, making a plan that is 17, 18 counties big uh, can feel a little unwieldy when a lot of times the, the both the benefits and the harms from natural infrastructure or a lack of natural infrastructure are felt on the city block or on the neighborhood scale. I live in South Austin and I know um, there are huge, huge problems with neighborhood flooding that disproportionately impact some neighborhoods over others. And so I think that was the thing that we really struggled with um, in this plan. We really tried to dial into some of those um, some of those pieces by looking specifically at urban heat island effects, by looking at recreational access. And it turns out that recreational access to nature, to green spaces, is a huge need in the urban I-35 corridor. There's also a huge need in the very rural portions of far western Edwards counties where there's just not a lot of public access to recreation. And so I think identifying those um, areas of critical need is a really good way to allow us to be more strategic and focused on addressing those needs first, um, as opposed to looking and grappling with a, a big 18 county region. Um, I'm really excited uh, to just keep on socializing this plan and the tools that come with it the county by county maps um, that can dial down into a much more manageable geography. Um, we've been really uh, working hard to roll this out to the media and to get stories about the importance of natural infrastructure. Um, you all know that they are, there are opportunities on every ballot, but especially this November, to um, approve some big investment opportunities that could really be leveraged for the conservation of natural resources, for improving our, our you know, responsiveness to water issues. The two that all, I've already pointed out, the Travis County opportunity, but all Texas voters will have the opportunity to approve a Centennial Parks Fund that would dedicate a billion dollars to the creation of new state parks. That's something that will provide recreation opportunity, provides habitat, uh, provides the land conservation side of things that will benefit uh, residents of the Hill Country and visitors for generations to come. Uh, we also will hear more later about a huge opportunity to invest in our water infrastructure. This again, um, you know, narrowly focused, we could think of it as a pipes project, but we are working hard to expand that thinking, to think about how a new billion dollar water fund for the state of Texas could be used to do things like protecting our recharge lands for all of those communities that depend on groundwater for um, their water source. So I think there's a lot of exciting opportunities um, coming down the line and, and that this report and all of the data and tools that come with it are gonna really help us be better advocates. Thanks, Catherine. Uh, ben and Azalea, if y'all wanna comment not only on what's exciting, but what the future of this looks like. Um, so, um, look, this is, a, this is a much needed tool. This shows a need. It shows the, this illustrates the need to protect natural infrastructure and it also shows us where that infrastructure exists. And so it's a tool that we can take to our decision makers, our leadership at the counties and the cities and the state to say, look, we have got to fund and or empower and or change our policies so that we can protect this natural infrastructure. In the case of Kendall County, as, as Catherine mentioned, you know, we sold our bond on water protection. And frankly, natural infrastructure, although we didn't name it that, was the essence of what we were saying. We have to protect our recharge features, our stream sides. We have to protect our water supply in general, our, our watersheds. 
Um, so this will, the tool will be used by our committee to help inform how we go about uh, utilizing those bond dollars, but it also creates a call to action for other communities to do the same thing, to pass a bond to protect the natural infrastructure of their community. Um, so I think that's the, the, probably the greatest benefit of it. And I also have to be honest with you, look, I don't, you know, this is probably not going to be a static document. I bet our tool is going to evolve over, over years to come. And I look forward to seeing artificial intelligence come into the fold, uh, for example. I know, I know uh, Rachel's over there. I love that it only scared. took 30 minutes for AI to yeah. come into the summit. AI <laughs> is here, people. But, but, it, but it has the potential to help us see things that we might not see with our more limited individual minds, let's put it that way, and thereby to better show shape a future for natural infrastructure protection. But basically, here's my takeaway. Guys, leverage this. Leverage this to change policy. Leverage this to get conservation dollars committed to protecting natural infrastructure. Yeah, um, I couldn't agree more. I think, you know, going off the theme of this whole summit today is uh, going from vision to action, and that's really what I look forward to the most, is seeing what partners, um, how they use this tool to putting and implementing action behind conservation and behind nature-based solutions, because they are very much needed, as we know. Um, also with that, just kind of keeping in mind the holistic and different kind of complexes as we know the Hill Country is and kind of seeing how that moves forward when it comes to land, water, and sky. Um, and with that, like, I just, again, I can't echo this enough from Ben, but yes, increasing funding because it is there, but making sure it's going into the right areas when it comes to nature-based solutions. Um, the other thing, as you were saying, like in the future, what I look forward to the most in our next iteration is um, incorporating more of traditional ecological knowledge practices. I know a lot of us lean a lot on Western science, which is great, and I love that, and I as well, I'm a scientist myself, but I also think um, when we do a little things a little bit more holistic, it really kind of rounds everything out. And so not just Western science, but doing a combination in traditional ecological knowledge of sciences, as well as uh, seeing more wildlife critical habitat areas protected, kind of goes uh, back to what Catherine was saying, and those kind of things can get done when we look at things to get passed, like the new Centennial Bill um, that's gonna be on the ballot this November. Hallelujah. <laughs> Do we have questions from the audience? Yeah, let's hear from you guys. What questions? Hi, my question is um, about diversity and, and how to reach, you know, this new population. Um, I know that a lot of people have taken the efforts to translate and we have definitely run into um, problems with like species of animals that you can't literally translate them because you know a different culture calls them something different altogether. But one of the problems beyond translation is like, okay, now you have translated materials. How do you get them into the hands of those people? That's where I find the biggest barrier. Do you have any advice? on where, you know, this new almost majority in our state, where do they get their information? Because people like me get it in one place that they don't get it. So I need to know how to get them where they live and where, and, and through resources they trust. No, absolutely, and that's a great question. Um, one of the things that I really solely believe is in partnership and leaning on our allies, and in this room right now, I don't know if someone wants to raise their hand, but we have really great Spanish translation allies that do a lot of um, conservation work in both languages. Um, on top of that, we have uh, communities, like I know on the last panel, we'll hear from community leaders, something that I'm actively involved in and also um, that's in our community is Latino Outdoors. It's not necessarily um, sold and rooted in conservation, it's more into outdoors door access, but necessarily they have a really big presence on social media and getting um, interviews and kind of stuff like that. And there will be, there'll be the regional coordinator um, for San Antonio later here today. She's a really good resource to use. Um, and as well as I would ask, you know, are we reaching things out, um, not just, you know, the Austin Statesman and the San Antonio Express, but also El Mundo? You know, that's one thing I will say, too. Like, if we're going, to, you know, to go to those efforts to translate, like, that's great, but let's make sure, like, we're putting it in, like, media that people are reading, and those are media channels that people are reading. I can add a little bit to that, maybe. Um, one of the things that I'm learning from our partners is forming 
these reciprocal relationships and how important it is to have these partnerships where we're not just handing down expertise, but we are actively listening and learning from our full community and working with them to find solutions together. Um, David Bugs last year said, don't make decisions for me without me. And it's really important that we remember that we, we don't have all the knowledge. We are still actively gathering knowledge and forming these relationships with communities. I'd like to piggyback on what you just recommended. Not only do not make decisions without me, but do not do translations without me. Uh, I'm Laura Sarate with Plants and People and the Native Plant Society of Texas, and it's an honor to translate materials for them for the coming up Texas Native Plant Week, so mark the date, uh, October 15th through the, 30, uh, to the 21st. But oftentimes, people will say, let's get a translator, let's bring someone in. You have people in your community with 47% Latinos, you've got some excellent Spanish speakers, but it's not enough to be a Spanish speaker, you have, trans you have to have translation experience. And there's not just the literal translation, word for word, there's a cultural relevancy translation. <clears throat> so you don't just plug it into Google Docs. We used to work with rape crisis centers that would use all these automatic translators. When you do that, it's not picking up idioms. It's not being, you know, the, the subtlety of language. And native speakers can pick it up, so it's disrespectful create online groups, volunteers would love to translate, but also get some stipends and honor the technical you know, expertise of translations. All I'm saying is that there's a rich, a rich, bountiful resource in Hayes County to tap into, but including people in your groups, in your meetings, in your organizations and leadership will help and not just come you know, from a translator. That's so important, thank you. Hello, uh, I live up in Cedar Park and I, I guess one, uh, kind of an extension of like the natural infrastructure thing, I'm starting to learn like getting involved with like some of the strong towns, um, the group is that it's another aspect of it is like our traditional development models is just sprawl and there might be efforts that go into like changing zonings and kind of rethinking the development that in turn preserves natural infrastructure and conservation areas. And I was just kind of wondering like, how does like our groups and our efforts um, kind of tie into maybe that aspect that benefits it as well? So, so I, I just trying to understand the question. So you're asking about like, you know, how can we basically um, in, in comp uh, include natural infrastructure into our built environment, our planning and development practices? Is that fair Yeah, it's kind of like updating like whether it's zoning ordinances and different things that kind of in indirectly help our efforts. So, so here's the thing. Um, when you think about just in Kendall County, we've been thinking about, okay, we have these recharge features, right? You have these, these swallow holes or you have these sinkholes, et cetera. Those are already places where you could put stormwater, because that's what they've been doing, is collecting stormwater. But you don't want to put stormwater in there that's polluted. So that gets back into green infrastructure or low-impact development uh, solutions that can filter that stormwater. But instead of you know, clearing that area out and putting in a detention pond and, like I don't know, lining it with clay, why not go ahead and harness that water, make that part of a rainwater harvest system, and channel it into those features? The other thing too is that we really need to slow water down and sink it in. We need it to go to the subsurface, both to feed the, the natural hydrology, but also because you know the, the edges of your stream sides are basically like these micro wetlands. It's the seep, and moisture is seeping out of them and maintaining the base flow of our streams. So if we can say, hey, look, guys, by by maintaining our, our stream systems, we are mitigating flood effects, but we're also benefiting our base flows and we're also benefiting our recharge, then hopefully we can help them understand that this is an economically beneficial thing to do. Um, so those, those, are, those are the two off of the top of my mind. Um, but I think, that's, I think you have a good point. Look, Strong Towns USA, which is what you premised this com com question on, they focus on the economics of development practices and how we are making decisions now that actually have an economic cost in the future. And so we need to be thinking more about the future economic costs as we make decisions now. And preserving natural infrastructure, I would argue, is a really good case for economic, a conservative approach to um, development practices. 
I would also agree with that and that there are um, different architecture like practices like biophilic practices for example that are really um, being used all around the world and that we're starting to see kind of be implemented now which if you're not familiar with biophilic uh, architecture it's practices kind of where we see like in Singapore where there's greenery all around their buildings and so it's encompassing so it really does um, harness like both benefits and of course like as we know any kind of uh, nature any kind of infrastructure like that is going to increase positivity and it's really going to just promote um, like our moods and there, there's just a thousand a thousand and one benefits like why we should be incorporating stuff like that and so I would say like that's a that's another way to go um, and of course I can't really speak from it from a development side but I just know like those are practices um, that I've been like um, I've been talking to other architectures about because they're looking for really creative ways of same thing how can we introduce nature-based solutions while still not compromising development I'll just chime in to say, I think you're right to point out the role of developers, and we've talked about policy, we've talked about what cities and counties can do, and in a lot of ways, counties, especially in Texas, um, are somewhat constrained on what they can do. Um, we want to push them to do as much as they can, but um, the reality is, if we're not talking to developers about the ways that they can minimize their footprint and um, incorporate the enhancement, uh, the protection of some of these natural infrastructure systems into their their plans from the get-go um, that we're missing a huge opportunity. I think Hayes County has done a really good job of thinking about how can they help to incentivize, use carrots to draw developers to that more conservation-oriented development. Um, and we would hope that that conversation would continue out to, to other counties in Texas. Thanks. That's all the time that we have, but we will be around today to chat more. And uh, here's to another 10 leadership summits and good years of conservation. <laughs> well, thank you.